Good morning. I'm a bit late. I'm 371 days late. The Irish are notorious for being late. Who was here last year? I'm very sorry. My name is Rowan Manahan, and I believe this to be a fraud. This is a gigantic hoax perpetrated by Alexander Kerlf. Listen to the word, abasgle. Clearly, this is not a real word. Any, any civilized person can know this is not a real word. I became suspicious when talking to Alexander, and he told me that he got the idea from ancient Rome, where we have a problem like this, he said, and back in Pompeii, there is a mosaic, he said, and I said, that picture looks familiar, and I went looking on the internet, and I found the original picture. <laughs> It was the plug at the bottom that gave it away. I realized there was a hoax going on here. It's not a real word. What is this in instead? What, what, what is this really about? Well, I went to the ultimate source of everything that is true and factual in the world, Wikipedia. And I, I typed in the word, and I hit enter. And what did it say? No such word exists. <laughs> There is no entry for this, this makey uppy word of Alexander's. This is, this is a hoax. I went to the hoax website, snopes.com, and double checked. Sure enough, false. <laughs> Who is the perpetrator of this, of this falsehood upon the world? Once again, there he is. <laughs> this man is not to be trusted, ladies and gentlemen. He, is, he has nefarious purposes. Be careful, be careful. Abistle is the sound that small children make when you try to make them eat vegetables and pulses, <laughs> particularly broccoli. <laughs> do you want to inflict this on small children, ladies and gentlemen? Do not be part of this, ladies and gentlemen. But it is an interesting concept, isn't it? Happiness in the workplace. Is this possible? Is this realistic in the modern era? More and more people think yes, and more and more people are saying yes, it should be. I work a lot with people who are Wondering, can they balance happiness with success and with, with fulfillment in their work as well as, as, as satisfaction and joy from that work? And we're trying to find out whether that's possible or not in, in my work. And myself and Alexander are having long chats about this, even though, as I say, I, I fear that the police will arrive before the end of the day here. Abraham Lincoln said it so beautifully, and far be it for me to correct the man who wrote the Gettysburg Address, but the word I would use in the modern era is, as they plan to be as they plan to be. Very few people plan. Why? Well, this is a real problem in terms of our DNA. As I said in, in the introduction, what's the crossover between human DNA and chimpanzee DNA? 98.5%. Now that we can, we can count the genome and we can measure every single thing, mathematically, we are almost indistinguishable from our hairy, simian, chimpanzee cousins. And the problem with that is, that means that most of us are sitting at the top of a tree with our arm wrapped around the tree, maybe our leg as well. We have a banana. We can see our next banana. And everything is good in the world. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> we, need to, we need to evolve beyond this. Tests done in the early 1970s in the United States, Stanford University, Michel Aral, um, the, the marshmallow test, you may have come across it. They put a bunch of small children, five-year-olds, in the room, and they said, there's a marshmallow. That's your marshmallow. If you wait five minutes before you eat this marshmallow, I will give you another marshmallow. <laughs> Let's just say there were varying degrees of success in this experiment. <laughs> I, without ethics committee approval, conducted this experiment on my own children. <laughs> the first one started negotiating with me straight away. Just one more marshmallow, Daddy. That doesn't sound like an awful lot of marshmallows, Daddy. I think if I wait for five minutes, that's a very long time, Daddy. I am only five years old. I think I should get at least three marshmallows, Daddy. <laughs> she is very scary. I ran from the room. <laughs> the second daughter? I put the marshmallow on the table. I begin to explain the rules. She ignores the marshmallow on the table. She grabs the bag of marshmallows, and she ran out of the room. <laughs> what they discovered in the original test was that a small proportion of the population are capable of deferring their gratification. They don't go, as I do. <laughs> they will put off the gratification. And 
What does that translate to in adult life? In adult life, that means that in this room, we have a small proportion of people who are capable of restraining themselves and eating a healthy, balanced diet. And the rest of you are like me, and you wish that was a real pie. <laughs> this is instant versus deferred gratification. <laughs> Workplace happiness was not an issue until very, very recently. Through the period of evolution from the green slime in the, in the pond all the way up through the various stages of the ascent of man. Are you worried about Abishkla? No, no, no. <laughs> until we finally get to Homo sapiens. And we've been around, what, 100,000 years? And probably only in the last few decades of that have we suddenly started going, hang on a minute. It's about experience. Now that most of us work without our muscles, now that most of us work sitting down or, or using our heads or, or speaking to people all the time, whether it be on the telephone or over a computer, experience is becoming more and more important to us. In the early eras of, of, of humankind, this was not important. Now, the ephemeral, the things that you cannot touch, they have become very important. And we attach enormous value to them. And we feel very unhappy when they don't happen for us. I believe that happiness can be identified from primary school mathematics. The Venn diagram, remember where the, where the intersection of the circles? Yeah, here are my circles. The first circle is the circle of skill, the things that you are naturally talented at, the things that you are educated for, the things that you have developed very hard work and developed better and better skills at. Things that the marketplace will say, yes, you're very good and therefore we will pay you more because you are a brain surgeon and you are somebody who works in McDonald's, so we will pay the brain surgeon a little bit more. But crossing over between that is the second circle, which is the circle of enjoyment. Now, the problem with that for a lot of people is there is a small overlap between these two circles. Because you can be very, very gifted at something, but not derive any satisfaction from it. I had this problem in my work in the corporate world years ago. And finally, because of course we live in the real world, we also must worry about the very ugly subject of money. And there needs to be an overlap between the three. For most people, the overlap is too small. We have to make it bigger. We have to make it stronger. For some people, this is my situation in the workplace many years ago. I was very good at it. I was getting very well paid. I was deriving very little satisfaction from it. Not good enough. I had to, had to change. I have an ulcer scar from here to here because I was in the wrong job. So what you want is a very close overlap between these three circles. And if you can get that, you have a big, happy, green zone. And you jump out of bed on Monday morning looking like Tigger from the Winnie the Pooh stories, yeah? Bouncing on your tail, <laughs> rather than Eeyore. <laughs> there are simple things that you can do to get past the cynicism that George Carlin so beautifully described that happens in the workplace. Simple, simple things that you can do, and you can achieve real joy, real, real delight, real happiness. I want to talk about five very quickly here this morning, just simple ideas. Number one. You arrive on this planet, you are empty. You are, in Latin, a tabula rasa, a blank slate. Uh, somebody said you, you arrive naked, wet, and hungry, and things go downhill from there. <laughs> you learn to be something. You, sometimes you fulfill an ambition. Sometimes it, it is forced upon you because your family are in the business or so forth. Maybe you learn a second thing. Maybe you desire to change. Maybe you have to change. In Ireland, for instance, we've had a crash in the construction sector, and lots of people who used to wear a hard yellow hat can no longer make a living doing that. They have had to change, and this is very uncomfortable for them. But one way or another, what we are discovering is that in the modern ephemeral world, I'd like to be a magician. In the modern ephemeral world, many, many people are having to go back to school and learn new skills in order to stay afloat in the world of work. And this, of course, means change, change, change. And we're not very good at change as human beings. We, we react rather noisily in the early stages of the change process. And we try and pretend it's not happening, or we sulk about it, and we complain about it. And gradually, we move towards acceptance. The difficulty, I think, that most of the people that I am working with, particularly in the, in the private sector, in the corporate world, is that they're not just doing this once. They're having to do it numerous times. For example, the travel industry, so changed. We, years ago, we would go to a travel agency, and we would say, I want to go on holidays, and I want to go here, and I want this kind of hotel, and that kind of flight, and somebody would organize this all for you. Now you do it yourself. Years ago, couriers, you would see people on motorcycles or on bicycles zooming around the city all the time, carrying pieces of paper. 
Now we hit the send button and off it goes. And the people who make those envelopes and the people who make those business cards and compliment slips and, and all of the little pieces of paper that we were sending around the city. We don't kill so many trees anymore, do we? So things change. And indeed, I hear a lot of people describing their working life as feeling like a bit of a hurdles race. And you can see why. <laughs> Number two, you need to find the thing that you are amazing at. <laughs> this is Natsumi Hayashi, and she can levitate. Every day, she takes a photograph of herself levitating. And what she has learned is that if she takes enough photographs and jumps at just the right moment and maintains complete stillness, she can give the illusion of levitation. And she's wonderful at it, and she has a blog, and I'm sure she makes a few euros every now and then from her blog. And, and just the grace of her movement is extraordinary. No Photoshop, just genius, simple, clear genius. I had a skill which I have not been able to broker into a career. I am very disappointed about this. Maybe in the break, we can, we can have tests and see who's, who's quicker than, than, than someone. Huh? Mine, not so good. I had, to, I had to give up my future as a Rubik's Cube expert <laughs> and go and pursue a, a, a life in the corporate world. A Dutch gentleman, Leon Keane, painted this in my hometown in Dunleary in Dublin a little while ago. An amazing job. This is painted on the ground with chalk. And he completes the illusion. Absolutely extraordinary skills. Find what you're amazingly skilled at. Be clear. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, that is not something that you are aware of. Sometimes that is something that you do, and it, you feel it's no big deal, but other people look at you going, oh my god, how does he do that? How does she do that? And because it doesn't cost you pain to do it, you think it's no big deal. You need to know what these things are. If you can find something on the right-hand side of the bell curve that you are amazingly skilled at, if you can avoid the things that cause you pain on the left-hand side of the bell curve, you will have a much happier working existence. The problem in the world of work today is that too many people are living in the middle zone, what my children now refer to as meh. <laughs> meh. It's such a great word. Don't be in the meh zone. Move. Move to the green. Come to the light. Number three, hi, mum. All Irish boys bring their mothers with them. <laughs> Sometimes you need to ignore your mother's advice. All over the world, every culture I've ever visited, all mothers say the same thing to their children. Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> I say you need to talk to strangers. You need to stop letting them be strangers. You need to make them friends. You need to make them co-conspirators. You need to make them allies. You need to build a network around you. And people are so averse to this idea of a network. You have a network anyway. Unless you are living on your own in a cave, you have a network. You have people around you. Kurt Vonnegut said, the problem with human beings is they don't like maintenance. <laughs> And a network feels like maintenance. How many people here have suffered a significant loss of data from a computer because they didn't have an adequate backup system? Be honest. Thank you. Maintenance. We're all very good at taking the hundreds of photographs and dropping them on our computer, and then we forget to make the backup. Maintenance. And that's what the network is about. If you want to do something extraordinary, if you want to make an amazing film, if you want to build an amazing product or service, if you want to make for a happy department that you work in, you need to have a network of talented people around you. The original credits for The Lord of the Rings, the first film, took 22 minutes <laughs> to go up on screen. They had to cut them and they had to squish them and they had to roll things into each other to try and get it down. In the special edition DVD, the credits took 30 minutes because they gave credit to everybody who had been involved. That's how many people it takes sometimes to make for something extraordinary. So I refer to this as the permanent campaign. It's an expression that comes from the Clinton era. The gentleman on the left is called Sidney Blumenthal. He was Clinton's advisor back in the 1980s. And he said, even when you have been elected, you continue to behave as though you're on the campaign trail. So even if you're in a wonderful job, even if you are happy with the colleagues that you have and the products and services that you are using and delivering, you think to the future. Always, always think to the future. Number four. In thinking to the future, you think about your reputation. Has anyone been to St. Paul's Cathedral in London? That's ah, extraordinary. It really is. You stand. <laughs> 
wow, it's just, in the 17th century, they built this. It's just magnificent. The gentleman who designed it was called Christopher Wren. He's buried in the, in the cathedral in the southeast Isle. You can find his little tiny little stone, very discreet, very humble. I love the line at the end. Lector si monumentum requiris circumspice, which means, reader, if you're looking for my monument, look around you. <laughs> On a much more humble level, this is the house that I grew up in. It was a Napoleonic fort. We were repelling the, the French in case, uh, in case of invasion back in the, in the, in the, at the turn of the 19th century. It's lit, built beside uh, the, the James Joyce Tower Museum, which features at the beginning of the book Ulysses. Um, on the way over to that house along the coast road, there's a little area where you can park five cars and look out at the sea and have a smoke or a coffee and enjoy the, enjoy the lovely view and the friendly Irish welcome. And there's a bench with a plaque on the bench. And I never met Gordon, but I think what a wonderful epitaph. Dreadlocks into moonlight. <laughs> He was a contemporary of mine. I was born in 1964, so only a few years younger than me. I have no idea who he was, but I'd love to have met him. Think about your reputation. Think about what people will spontaneously say about you in your career and job and work now, and what you want them to say when you have moved on and you were doing something different. And finally, number five. You need to bring a sense of urgency to this. I am 371 days late for this conference, and I'm very sorry. 371 days ago, this is what I looked like. I was in the heart failure unit in the major teaching hospital in the city centre in Dublin. The burn marks on my chest, I cannot say I recommend if anybody's ever had them. There was something that they don't tell you about when you're watching Grey's Anatomy or ER or any of the medical dramas. When you wake up and they've done the dump dump on your chest, there is a smell. A smell of burnt pork. The cannibals called human beings long pig, and I can see why. <laughs> you need to start now. You need to not put it off. You need to not say, ah, it'll be grand, because it might not be. Sometimes, the, literally, the world can fall out from underneath your feet. This is a sinkhole, which looks like it goes to the center of the earth in Guatemala. These look like Lego bricks. They are, in fact, 13-meter-long containers in Fujisawa in Japan, the tsunami. You never know. You have to be careful, and you have to think about this. And far too many people are skating on thin ice when it comes to their working life and their career. They are hoping everything will be fine. They are not thinking. They are not acknowledging the realities of what's going on around them. So those are my five simple thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Be ready for the changes that are out there. Find the thing that you love and, 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 and make sure that it crosses over with the things that, that you're, you're really talented at. Build a team of people around you. Think long term. Far too many monkeys with the, with the banana. <laughs> Don't be the monkey. Embrace the 1.5%, not the 98.5%. And do it now. I'll leave you with one final thought. John Lennon from the Beatles said that when he was a little boy, his mother said to him that the most important thing in life was to be happy. And at five years of age, he went to school, and he went and he did a little test in the school where they talked about themselves and they talked about their families. And they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he wrote, happy. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand the exercise. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and attention. My name is Roland Manahan. It's a pleasure to meet you.